Welcome to Praise Hands, home of the Praise Hands, where we are all about creative, cross-cultural Christianity. Today's episode is brought to you by thechurchahead.com, resources and advice for forward-thinking Christian leaders. Here on the Praise Hands podcast, we examine the American intersection of church, race, music, and economics. Over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about economic healing. I guarantee you've never heard anything like this before. Here in America, we rarely question economic systems that are optimized to give us what we want. We are obsessive about the quality of our products, but dismissive about the quality of our ethics. Over 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, we still rely on slaves for everything from food to fashion, and the church has been silent. But is Christianity supposed to be silent in the face of injustice? What if there's a place for Christian ethics in our economic systems? Over the next three weeks, we'll hear from three solutionists whose Christian faith has led them to the work of economic healing. And our guest today is Barrett Ward. Barrett's fashion company, Able, is a lifestyle brand focused on ending generational poverty through providing economic opportunity for women. But it doesn't stop there. Able also helps business owners and fashion consumers quantify and improve the quality of their social impact. For this episode, my friend and human trafficking expert, Lexi Lavalle, joined me as a co-host at the Able Flagship Store in Nashville. This is a game-changing conversation, so let's jump right in. So Barrett, before we get to anything else, I, I want to point out something that is very, very important for our listeners to know. And that is that you are a GQ award winner. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, who told you that? Um, I don't know, Google. Yeah, Google did. Well, it was not because of my style, that's for sure. <laughs> You're in a white t-shirt with some black jeans. jeans but I'm yeah. also five, set, five foot six and early gray. Yeah. I'm chubby. So basically like the opposite of runway model. Yeah. Okay. So that's not the GQ side of what I was involved in. It was for, it was called, it, it was a leader's award for people doing good work in the world. That's what yeah. they try to do is they try to elevate. And it was a really interesting event, actually. I mean, I, do you know that guy um, from uh, Friday Night Lights, the Taylor Kitsch, is that his name? He's the prettiest man I've ever seen. I was, I was, I was in an interview. I was in an interview on the red carpet. And all of a sudden he walks up and I look over at him and just double take and stopped in the middle of what I was saying. And it's not because it was a celebrity. I mean, we've all seen celebrities. It's not a big deal. It's because he's the prettiest man alive. Go Google him. Taylor Kitsch. Yeah. And so did he get an award that night? Um, Yes, he did. Okay. I think he did. So you're basically in that same sort of league. (laughs) Yeah. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. (laughs) Awesome, Barrett. So can you tell us about how Abel started and how it's accomplishing its mission today. It's 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 funny to think back. I mean, my wife and I, when we were first first getting married, she got a job offer to move to Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like I don't. I I'm sure other people have plans for their lives, and they think about here's where we're gonna mm-hmm. go, and we're gonna be strategic. And I feel like every step I've taken has been reactive, to mm-hmm. be honest. Mm-hmm. And and that first one was my wife getting a job offer in Ethiopia to run an adoption agency, and mm-hmm. so. I had started a nonprofit at that point called Mocha Club, and Mocha Club was working with women and children in Africa, so I went over there with Mocha Club, Mm -hmm. and while we were there and working with women, women coming out of the commercial sex industry, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the thing that they told me was, look, we're grateful for this rehabilitation, Mm -hmm. it's wonderful, and also, if we don't have a job after this is over, what do you expect us to do? Right. And so that was a super seminal moment for me. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, the other side that was very motivating to me was hearing these women's stories. Yeah. I mean, the, the, these are not women of weakness. They're not mm-hmm. making bad choices in mm-hmm. life. And in fact, you know, it's outrageous. They're making the most heroic choices. Because mm-hmm. what would you do? Would you make those kind of sacrifices for your children? You know, I can't imagine. I've never even been in a situation where I would have to consider that. You know, yeah. I, I I'm not even in a position in my life with family and friends that I could ever end up homeless, I don't think, you know? Yeah. And so I just sit in that seat and then meet these women that are willing to do anything for those yeah. that they love. And it's just it's just this moment of, okay, let's go to battle together. Let's figure this out. And so they said, we'd love to make scarves. So we started making scarves. 
If they would have said, let's make glasses, we would have made glasses. I don't know anything about fashion. Mm -hmm. But my wife picked out a cute scarf, so we started training three women, Bezawayu, Mulu, and Meslu, to start making these scarves on these ancient limbs that you work with a shuttle. We put them up on the web on our site, and we called it fashionable at the time. And all of a sudden, within about two months, we had sold 4,123 scarves. Wow. And we were like, holy mackerel, we've got something here. Yeah. And it was either that it was the most cute scarf in the history of the world or a little bit of that. And the fact that I think women were identifying with the fact that, look, women just want an opportunity. Mm -hmm. They just want to stand on their own two feet. They want to, they want to own their, their success, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and we kind of felt like the biggest thing that people started realizing at that time was charity is critical. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be serious about Solutions to Poverty, kind of like what you said, Lexi, about the mission, if you're going to be serious about Solutions to Poverty, there is socially scientific evidence that proves the fact that you, number one, have to create jobs, and number two, you have to do so for women. So that's the business we're in. Creating jobs for women is a serious solution to ending generational poverty. So I've seen some of those numbers on the economic impact that providing more jobs for women can have. And even some of the studies that have come out about you know, gender equality in the workforce and things like that. Mm. Um, one of the things that we look a lot here on this podcast at is systemic solutions and specifically at the concept of systems theory and systems thinking to look at the whole ecosystem of how one idea affects all entrance into that particular economy. And one of the questions that I have is with the conversations about gender equality in the yeah. workforce, how does that affect, say, kids? You know, before the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years or so, it wasn't common for, for women, especially in America, to really need to work. Not more of them are. Mm. I, my mom stayed home with me. Yeah. You know, and, and we have four daughters, and I'm grateful that my wife gets to stay home with the kids. And, mm-hmm. and she kind of phased out in consulting into her career. And yeah. by, the, by the time she had a fourth child, we had our fourth daughter it would became unmanageable. Right, right. But, you know, I hope that even within that, that that's not considered an archaic thought, but that we're actually doing it in a progressive way because sure. I'm pretty involved with the kids. Yeah, and right. I'm wildly involved. Yeah. I made heart pizzas on Valentine's Day. Yeah, um, as you should. As I should have. But, you know, I also think that what you're describing is a very Western concept. In the developing world that I've been in, women are working. So in situations of poverty, there's not really a choice. Everybody's got to come to the table in agrarian societies. Mm -hmm. Right, pre-industrial revolution. Yeah, I mean, all that becomes a reality where, where parenting doesn't become as gender identified. Right. Or is displaced from parenting either. Or is displaced. That's a great, that's a better way to say it actually. So yeah, I see um, communities raising children as well. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the United States now, you may not even know your neighbors. Right. Right. Much less near, live near people that want to invest in your family, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in in Ethiopia, I mean, it's an all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. It's not latchkey that the kids are home. There's an Mm -hmm. entire community around protecting those children and, Mm -hmm. and somebody's always going to be around. So... So providing jobs for women could actually enable them to be better parents. Well, yeah, I think so. Let's talk for a second. You mentioned, you know, that you know, some of those concepts are a very Western thing, which I completely agree with. Let's talk for a second about the history of fashion and ethics in America. Um, near the end of the 18th century, tobacco crops had depleted the land of the American South and slavery was kind of on its way out. And then in 1793, a man named Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin and revitalized the South, South's economy and reinforced its dependent on African-American slaves. So back then, the regional and national economy, to a degree, depended on slave labor. And we look back in horror. Have the ethics of American fashion changed in the last 200 years? Well, you know, I, I think what's happened is we, we saw labor movements especially with women doing a lot of the manufacturing in the fashion industry early, you know, 1900s, we started seeing labor movements equal the rising of wages, right? Mm -hmm. And so the most expensive part typically of any garment is going to be the the labor. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so what you see happen is, is the United States just outsource that problem, right? So that's not having manufacturing here in the United States didn't happen just because. It happened because, you know, I think the United States industries were looking for 
places for cheaper labor. And that continues on today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't have any problem mentioning Nike. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like mentioning Nike. Yeah. <laughs> and I love Colin Kaepernick. But, you know, you can also see that they got busted, you know, in 1996 for a little boy sewing a football with a Nike on the side of it. And we saw consumer demand say, that's yeah. no good. Yeah. They weren't going to change. They tried to PR spin it like crazy, yeah, yeah. but then consumers kept saying no. Yeah. And so once shareholder value dropped, you right. make a choice, right? right? And even now we see, you know, today you ask about the, how it just continues to, the problem rolls around the world is I even saw recently with the World Cup that they had started doing or moving a lot of their production during that time for World Cup jerseys and such and footballs. Mm -hmm out of China into Cambodia and sure. Indonesia. Or rage spots. And the article that's written with their PR person says something to the effect beautifully of, well, we pay at least the local minimum wage and we're committed to working with the local local government influences and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all you literally have to do is a Google search and find out also the wages are a lot lower there. Right. You know, you got a problem when uh, China's labor is becoming too expensive, sure. right? And so they're just chasing it around the world. It's just right. a, it's just a view of humanity that they're not what matters. Yeah. Shareholder matter, right. matters. And and look, we're a for profit, and I'd love to have a boat someday. Yeah. Um. You know, but at the end of the day, that's not going to be built on on the backs of people. It's yeah. going to be built by first establishing who we are as a company. That our minimum wage is fourteen dollars right. here in Nashville, yeah. and the living wage is somewhere around eleven dollars in yeah. Nashville right now. Yeah. Or we're gonna make every single woman here at, in our Nashville offices, eighty-one of them. Mm -hmm. and, well, there's eighty-seven employees total, and eighty-one of them are women here. This is a women's-run company. Mm -hmm. I'm just a guy who had an idea that yeah. I can do jazz hands. But but all of those women are owners in this company, mm -hmm. so they will also be a part of the success of our company. You have like a certain percentage of the equity in the company. Yeah, yeah. They have a certain percent of the options and equity in the company. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so the point of that is, is you, you, you establish first that information, mm -hmm. the things that are critical to you. Mm -hmm. And if you establish that, here's what's really crazy. Sure. We're actually growing as a company and we're building really good shareholder value. Yeah. And in right. today's society of an informed society, consumers are seeing that and the wave is coming. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's going to come where the exploitation thing is actually going to start hurting shareholder right. value and maybe taking a margin point less on your sales will equal greater shareholder value because you've invested in the people. It's, it's just a longer game, right? Yeah. yeah. So going back to what you said about during certain countries having such low rages, why is that? And what would the the implications be if they had a livable wage and they were paying those women creating all these products a livable wage. You know, that's the crazy thing is that uh, I've, I've read statistics that if these manufacturers were being uh, paid a living wage, they would only add one to three percent of cost to the end product. But if you think of the big game, you know, Walmart versus whoever else versus H&M. And, and really to call anybody out is somewhat unfair sure, because we're right. all complicit. Right. But also yeah. I'll still call out the big ones yeah. because they're driving the culture. Right. And the big ones, that 1% matters because when you scale out 1%, it's a billion dollars. Right. right? right. And shareholder value. Shareholder value, baby. Yeah. 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 So on that note, you know, you talked about chasing the the lowest wages possible around the world with the levels of artificial intelligence coming, you know, like replacement of factory workers and things like that. Uh, do, yeah. do you see that being a disruption to these industries? So because if they can find a lower wage by moving from China to Vietnam or Cambodia, mm. wouldn't they also do the same thing by moving from Cambodia to a robot? Right. I've heard at every side of the coin that the universal minimum wages will start sure. to matter or, um, but I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm. I don't see that in my lifetime, and I'm. And I already told you that I am barely just stumbling over the thing in front of me. So, <laughs> I'll let the smart kids figure that one out. Sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> So earlier you mentioned a lot of these communities that you've worked in kind of becoming dependent on charities, so to speak. How does that affect generational poverty and impoverished communities? And how is a social enterprise model like Able coming in and changing the game? Well, I mean, the first thing I want to say is we're figuring it out. 
it's, it's a funny thing where you could think something's the most brilliant thing in the world and everybody thinks it's the most brilliant thing in the world and then four, four years later it's an abomination right mm -hmm. like the one one from one model was the most brilliant thing in the world and then everybody's knocking it five years later is something that's destructive and I think we, we better all move humbly along that path else we'd be the next one that thought we had the great idea and, you know and we've also seen these really interesting and fascinating studies where you heard of people giving like charities or even governments just giving four hundred dollars to someone over a two-year period or something like that and saying go figure it out and they do you know at first they tend to invest in the essentials and then next they start to figure out okay i got to figure out something sustainable or else this isn't going to last mm -hmm. so in the in the same way you know we've seen in ethiopia one of two two of the national directors that we had that used to work for us uh, as as kind of our chief negotiating officers and in, in country and administrating shipments and stuff mm -hmm. saw an opportunity and all of a sudden fortuna is a good friend of mine uh, said to me, she said, hey, what do you think about me leaving you as a national director and starting my own leather company? And I said, well, great, do it. And she became one of our manufacturers. And now she employs, I think, over 50 women. Wow. And they're all paid a living wage. I mean, the, the question is then, how does that really, really impact the communities, you know? And that's something that we're still studying and looking at. I mean, there's still broad studies and swaths of study that make that obvious, like, you know, from Oxfam, et cetera. But I think what we do see in real life is low recidivism back into those kind of lifestyles. And, and we do see people... Uh, you know, even here in Nashville, three years ago, there was just three women making jewelry here in Nashville, and now there's 28. And you hear their stories, and you know that it abates the risk of, of relapse, and you know that it slows down even recidivism into prison. I right. mean, mm -hmm. a lot of these people yeah. with a criminal record. So you, you do see those specific benefits really clearly, as well as the communal benefit. All right, time for a quick commercial break. Today's episode is brought to you by thechurchahead.com, resources and advice for forward-thinking Christian leaders. If you've got questions about human trafficking, supply chains, or other issues of economic healing, stop by thechurchahead.com to sign up for a free 30-minute coaching call with Lexi Lavalley or myself, Robbie Valderrama. In addition to coaching, The Church Ahead also offers contracting and courses. So surf on over or call 615-538-8778 for more information. Now, back to our show. So Barrett, one of the things that intrigues me the most, fascinates me about what you guys are doing is your accountable assessments. Uh, and this is where you quantify a company's social impact. Uh, I was actually blown away. Can, can you tell our listeners more about this project and why it's important to both fashion creators and consumers? It's really exciting, man. I mean, this is the part where you're going to get me to babble. I mean, look, when we were a small company, we just worked with three women, then 10, then 20, then 30, and we knew all the women and we yeah. knew the impact we were having. We knew right. them personally. Yeah. But all of a sudden we kept growing and as we stumbled over our own feet and not even necessarily knowing how we were doing it yeah. and how we were driving this growth, all of a sudden we're employing hundreds of people yeah. and we didn't know. I didn't have visibility. Yeah. And, and you know, I remember thinking at a, a period of time around four years ago, like, man, everybody's claiming social impact right now yeah. and they're not proving it. Yeah. And either am I, yeah. you know, now that our growth has gotten this mm -hmm. big. And so... I just couldn't, I, I couldn't sleep with that thought. I mean, I've said it before, it's kind of a cheesy statement, but I, I picture standing in front of St. Peter and, you know, him going, great job on selling a ton of bags. Why the heck didn't you invest more in making sure your impact on the women is what you said it was going to be? Sure. I mean, come on. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like 99% sure I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And if that's true... Yeah then while I'm here, we better do this the right way, right. you know? No matter what I believe the future and afterlife looks like, yeah. this needs to be done the right way here. Yeah. And so what we started digging into is looking at different audits out there and eventually found that we were dissatisfied with the fact of two things. One, that there was no audits that were as strongly focused on women as we wanted them to be mm -hmm. around their, like you said, gender equity, equality, mm -hmm. wages, benefits, safety, and things like that. And then the other thing we were really disappointed in is we weren't seeing these uh, assessments or audits that really had a strong emphasis of, 
boots on the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is somebody literally becoming physically present mm -hmm. at the manufacturer mm -hmm. and talking to every sure. single employee, yeah. right? And that's insane. <laughs> Some of the biggest ones that you could name only audit you once every four years. They only audit 10% of those that they give their, yeah. their symbol to. Mm -hmm. And that's just not going right. to take care of it. So invested alongside these brilliant folks in New York City called Good Ops. And they created this assessment that not only did the social side of it, but the environmental side. But mm -hmm. what we launched with was the social side mm -hmm. because there's a lot of pretty strong environmental mm -hmm. um, assets out there in the assessment space. Mm -hmm. But the social side, not really. Not, not to our satisfaction, I would say. Mm -hmm. So we developed this assessment and we launched it last fall. What we really believe is, is let's get everything out there. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody tells me that that's a risk, but that's not what I'm saying. And I find that when I stand on a stage or sit in a room and do a podcast, I find that listeners are excited when you tell them the bad stuff. When I stand on a stage and say, look, here's the deal. We're growing. We're having an impact on this many women. And here's one of the stories of one of the women that overcame a meth addiction. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Also, we've got serious second and third tier supplier issues. We found out we have serious safety issues in some of our manufacturing locations. Mm -hmm. And one of our manufacturers was almost rising to the level of forced labor within their manufacturing space. Mm -hmm. And you just watch people kind of go, why are you saying that? Mm -hmm. Are you an idiot? Yeah. And I'm finding that the reality is that we can give our consumers credit right. that they, they're smart enough now. They want to know this stuff. They know that there's something behind the curtain, behind yeah. the scenes, yeah. and they'd really like to know it. Yeah. And I would just close by saying, for me, it's a lot more fun doing it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't like to try to spend my time doing a PR spin. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be just butt naked and let people try to do a gotcha on me. Right. You know, yeah. and then find out, oh no, you've already got all that published? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not trying to hide anything because right. I don't want to put into the world that you have to be perfect before you can be honest. Yeah. I mean, we all got warts. It's all ugly. So let's just live that way in every aspect of our lives. You know, I'm not going to run a business any different than the way that I would want my marriage to look like sure. or my relationship with my four daughters to look like. Mm -hmm. Come on. I'm getting mad. No, you're, you're touching on something that's really important and it's, it's the ability for a business owner or a person to own their role in the system that they're in and to be honest about what that is. I think more business owners need to be adopting that sort of stance and the transparency to fight against some of the inclinations of the capital system. And one of the follow-up questions that I have for you is, I'm assuming the company currently is not publicly traded. I'm assuming privately held. Do you feel that you would be able to maintain that same level of transparency and integrity if your company was publicly traded? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Because it's really a consumer-driven movement. I mean, the reality is, is the way that this will work is if consumers continue to identify and believe in our company. And mm -hmm. we've seen them do that. We saw them super excited about that level of transparency. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's market-driven. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's investor-driven. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when you talk about being a public company, I think your concern is with the investors force a different path with transparency, right. maybe force you to pull back. But the reality is if we ever get to that place of going public, mm -hmm. then we got there by developing a brand that is built on that level of authenticity. Mm -hmm. So nobody's going to be able to switch that gear back right. or, or else the company immediately falls apart. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. That's really good. Speaking of like the consumers, so what can people do about maybe companies and brands that they love and they're not certain that their policies and their sourcing is ethical? Mm. How can they call them to accountability? Email them. Email them and see if their answers pass the sniff test. And it doesn't take much. There's one brand that's highly lauded as being ethical and I've sent them an email from multiple strange accounts that I've created <laughs> over the last five years. Yeah. And their answer as to do they pay living wages has not changed in the last five years from this extraordinarily spun statement of it's very complicated and we're working at it consistently trying to figure, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So just look and say, are you answering me straight or not? Yeah. You're smart enough, you know, as a consumer to just at least, you don't have to be wildly educated on this space to know 
that if you ask, are you given a living wage, whether they're giving you a straight answer or not, right? Mm -hmm. And you ask them about their environmental practices, if they respond with, look at this really cool shoe that we developed that's 100% recycled. Okay, that's cool, but what about your broad environmental practices? You know, I just think you'll find the answers you're looking for yeah. when, you, when you push, yeah. even just a little. Yeah, a lot of people think, man, I'm just one person, like, do my purchasing decisions you know, change anything. Well, they're the only thing that changes anything. Right. Well said. You know, so I think what else would, right. So I think we've got to be getting on board with that. Yeah. Have you heard of the good on you app? Mm, Yeah, maybe I've heard of several of those kinds. I think the way we see driving the movement is a couple of things. One is we are going to put just very simply on all of our products, Mm -hmm. this kind of nutritional label that we've developed. Mm -hmm that shows exactly what the wages of the person that made it, mm-hmm. as well as kind of our equality and our wages and benefits and our safety scores. Mm-hmm. I'm just way on the consumer movement side. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm, I'm living. Mm-hmm. Everybody's gotta pick their, their space, mm-hmm. but I'm just not counting on legislation or lobbying towards sure. the government as changing the money side of how we treat people, sure. right? Meaning if our minimum wage in Nashville hasn't gone up in 10 years, I don't, I'm not going to try to get it to go to 10 cents and think mm-hmm. of, you know, I'm not going to spend my life doing that. Right. But if I can figure out ways to empower consumers, mm-hmm. just picture a young lady getting a pair of jeans and she sees this label in today's world, she Instagrams it because mm-hmm. she wants her friends to see, hey, I'm doing something good in the world and these jeans look really cute on me. Mm-hmm. And, and then that passes around and that's one layer of the movement. And then the second layer of the movement is when you talk about that information com- coming up to a place where consumers can act on it. Mm-hmm. So as I said, the nutritional label is one side, but the other side is getting other brands on, on board. Like one of the things we're gonna be doing this summer is launching a Nashville coalition, mm-hmm. as well as in the future, a national coalition. Wow. And we've been lining it up with other brands and That's we're great. really excited. So, yeah. but how are we gonna launch it? Yeah. I mean, we're not asking, the governor to do anything with it. Yeah. We're, we're asking influencers and everybody to, you know, post on their Instagram about right. it and right. get consumers excited about that level of transparency. Right. And it's important that the accountable audit that we've created is actually going to be a nonprofit. It's a third party sure, sure. entity. Yeah. It all has to be straight. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we're going to drive it through that consumer side. I mean, mm-hmm. we want to be the next, uh, fire. What was it called? Fire festival. Fire festival. Except we don't want to, fall apart yeah. like they did. <laughs> but we want to look we want to be that cool so so talking about the transparency that your company operates with looking up and down the supply chain one of the emerging pieces of technology that's you know a very hot buzzword right now is blockchain and blockchain is essentially a ledger that enables for and by default you know complete transparency mm. do you see that technology being used to bring about you know more equitable wages in the fashion industry. Oh, for sure. We're, we're, we're looking at that right now. I literally just had a call yesterday with a family office in New York City that is interested in throwing a whole lot of money at what we're doing with Accountable, but with the specific purpose of leveraging technology. Yeah. And, you know, so for us, at the first level of it was that very people level of going and meeting with the individuals and mm-hmm. hearing what they have to say. And I still think that'll always have to be a part of it. But with blockchain and even cell, cellular technology, mm-hmm. I think the real end game there is is empowering the workers to be able to communicate. Feedback uh, loop. Yeah, a feedback loop. So, yeah, we're looking at all those technologies right now, and it's really exciting. I'm, I mean, I'm, I can't wait for even the middle of this year when you'll see some stuff in 2019 launched along that technology platform that we're, we're going to do. Yeah. That's great. Um, I've got a question for the two of you. On this show, we love finding creative cross-cultural solutionists that are collaborating to make the world a better place. How has working together encouraged both of you and what advice would you give to others trying to collaborate on a shared passion? Well, the Lexis of the world are rare, you know, but she fits the heart of what we're trying to do, which is to be totally transparent with her life, yeah. you know? Um, and, and she, <laughs> the other thing she did really well is kept emailing me and didn't know that I don't check email. <laughs> um, and so be assertive and go over and meet people and um, at the brands that you care about and the movements that you care about and volunteer your time, you know, and, and 
And through that, we developed a relationship. And then we held a beautiful event that was, you know, people were so excited about yeah. because this concept of modern day slavery is so, uh, so far from our daily lives, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That a, a, a young lady with blonde hair and blue eyes could tell a story that mm -hmm. other people could relate to, man, mm -hmm. that is, that's power. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Do you have anything to add to that, Lexi? Yeah, I think for me, uh, I have been involved in the nonprofit space for organizations that combat sex trafficking only. And uh, just kind of coming to terms with like labor trafficking and all these other things happening, it just doesn't make sense to me how many of the sex trafficking organizations print their shirts on shirts made in like <laughs> Bangladesh. And, Cambodia and all these places we know that's probably was an ethically sourced. I'm just like what like what what are, what are we standing for? Like it yeah. gotta be consistent like through the whole process in my opinion. And so um, and nobody's gonna be perfect, but yeah. that one seems pretty obvious, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Don't print your clothes. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. It's this issue completely ignored in the anti-trafficking movement in the United States about you know, the food we eat and the clothes we put on, the products we wear. And really that's much bigger of an issue, um, especially like overseas. It's just something to me, like you just can't ignore it. If you're gonna be about it, be about all of it. You can't just be about only sex trafficking to kids under 18, which is what a lot of people do. And that's awful and horrible, but it's awful and horrible also that a five-year-old in West Africa is picking cocoa beans for mm -hmm. your chocolate. Mm -hmm. To me, that's it's the same. And so having an outlet, um, an organization to kind of like support and rep and talk about and kind of be involved with is uh, feels really good to me because it feels like I'm at least... Full circle in your station. Yeah, trying to for, full circle it all. Yeah, yeah I agree. So Barry, I've got a question for you, um, and I don't know a lot about your faith background, but a lot of the people listening to this show are Christian leaders, and we talked earlier about in the South a couple hundred years ago what happened with slavery, and a lot of people may or may not realize that the church was silent, and but in many times actually advocated for slavery. You know, we look back again in, in horror at that. Do our faith communities today have a responsibility to speak out on these issues? Yeah, I mean, for me, I am no theologian and I, I'm not a pastor. And so to speak towards that type of leadership and how to use it, I don't know exactly. But, but what I do know is that if you just Google things like goats and sheep, and then all of a sudden you see a Bible verse. Jesus ain't talking about building walls and he's not talking about all, all this madness that we get so hyped up in the, in the Christian world about. Mm -hmm. But what he was definitely talking about was if you see a hungry person or you see a person that's thirsty mm -hmm. or you see a person that's lonely or homeless or any of those things and you don't respond mm -hmm. and you treat them like junk, mm -hmm. refuse, then you're going the other direction. And if you do, if you do love all those people, mm -hmm. then you loved me mm -hmm. and, and welcome to the kingdom. And that's what, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. And I don't, man, all the other stuff, I can't interpret that clearly. And I don't want to try to justify that, well, but politically or economically, we don't want to let this person or to help that person or whatever else. I find the people that are debating that stuff mm -hmm. really aren't helping anybody most of the time. They're really not digging in and figuring out how to help the true poor. They're just debating something because you know what? If you did go spend time with those people that I just described, especially if you're a believer, if somehow your heart has been re-engineered mm -hmm. um, by some kind of a Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. then you can't ignore those people once you've spent time. They will transform your life. You know, I wrote a blog years ago where I, when I moved to Africa about six months in, um, and it actually went pretty viral, but the blog was titled that I need Africa more than Africa needs me. Mm -hmm. And it was just this concept that, man, I went over there with an expectation of how much I was going to help. And mm -hmm. instead, I see people with extraordinary joy, just regardless of their circumstances. Mm -hmm. I see children playing with a ball of tied up trash, you know. And so for me, 
we have a responsibility to serve those that are first in the kingdom. And I think when you spend time with them, you'll realize why they are. Because <laughs> they actually have to lean into faith in a real and authentic way. And sometimes here, we're, I find it hard to find those places where I really need to depend on God. You sure. know? So wrapping up here, Barrett, how can our listeners learn more about what you're doing here at ABLE? Well, there's two great ways. You've seen the World Wide Web. Um, I've been on it. I've um, it's livefashionable.com is our website. Okay. And I invite you to go to the, the top of the nav bar, or the top of the site, and click first before you look at any products. Click on why we're publishing our wages and go learn that and see the reasoning behind it. It's pretty fun. Um, and see the nutritional label. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. You'll like it. Mm -hmm. And then the other opportunity is if you're in Nashville, which apparently every bachelorette party is, um, <laughs> come on by because it's, um, we'll, we, we want you to see the space and meet all the women and take a tour. It's, yeah. it's, um, I think when you come here, you'll see the light that is, um, that is, that is strictly developed by the women that work here and it's special. So come on by. So good. Well, thank you for sharing your journey with us. Thank you for opening up your space to us here. It looks beautiful. And we're thank you. And happy to be here. And yeah. uh, I'm so excited for our listeners to, to hear this story, to get immersed in it, and to be inspired to go and make change wherever they're at. So well, thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming by. And thanks for these mints. <laughs> I've been crushing these things. Whether you're a business owner, a fashion consumer, a Christian, or someone of a different faith background, I believe that we can all learn from how Barrett and his company are systemically loving this world. Next week on the Praise Hands podcast, we're going to hear more from Lexi Lavalley. What we didn't mention today is that Lexi is a survivor of sex trafficking. Her story is both devastating and motivating. It speaks to the worst and best parts of our humanity. In closing, I got a few things for you. First, I'd like to introduce you to algorithmic evangelism. You heard it here first, folks. Basically, the more people that rate and review and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, the more people their algorithms promote it to. So if you go on Apple Podcasts or iTunes and rate and review and subscribe to this, that will help our podcast get in front of potentially thousands more people. Second, if you text the word Robbie to 72727, I'll send you a text every Monday with some things that are inspiring my journey of creative cross-cultural Christianity. And third, Praise Hands is much more than a podcast. To learn more about our community, visit praisehands.com and click get involved. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in. This is the Praise Hands podcast, and I'm your host, Robbie Valderrama. We'll see you next week.